Good afternoon. My name is Jeremy Kidder. I am the organizer of the meetup group called Objectivists and Fans of Ayn Rand in Seoul, Korea. At our meetings, we study and discuss Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. I'd like to give a special thanks to YP Lee, Moke, and Partners who have graciously allowed us to utilize their seminar room. YP Lee, Moke, and Partners is one of the largest intellectual property firms in Korea. They have been servicing clients all over the world since 1985. Again, thank you very much. This brings me to my special guest, Dr. Yaron Rook. He is the executive chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute. Rook can be heard weekly on the Yaron Rook Show at Blog Talk Radio. I enjoy listening to the Yaron Rook Show podcast on Stitcher, but it's also available on iTunes. Dr. Brook is a frequent guest on national and radio and television programs, and he is an internationally sought after speaker and debater. He and his co-author, Don Watkins, wrote two books called Free Market Revolution, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government, and Equal is Unfair, America's Misguided Fight Against Income Inequality. Dr. Brook was born and raised in Israel. He served as first sergeant in the Israeli military intelligence and earned a degree in civil engineering. In 1987, he moved to the United States where he received his MBA and PhD in finance from the University of Texas at Austin. He became an American citizen in 2003. For seven years, he was an award-winning finance professor at Santa Clara University. And in 1998, he co-founded BH Equity Research, a private equity and hedge fund manager of which he is Managing Director and Chairman. Please give him a warm welcome, Dr. Yaron Brook. Thank you, thank you uh, Jeremy, and uh, thank you, Mr. Lee, for allowing us to use this facility and for being here. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, kind of a wonderful surprise for me because I, I didn't really expect to be uh, giving a talk uh, in Korea beyond my participation at the, uh, at the conference. So. Uh, next week, so uh, thank you, Jeremy, for organizing this. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, so, uh, equal is unfair. You know, the um, over the last few years, uh, inequality has become this big, enormous issue, uh, really globally. Uh, I don't remember hearing anything about inequality before the financial crisis, uh, and even in the few years after the financial crisis, there was nothing, and then it kind of exploded onto the scene over the last, uh, I'd say, five years or so. And really has become such a big issue that almost every problem in society is now blamed in one way or another on inequality, whether it's slow economic growth uh, in, in Western economies, or whether it's terrorism in the Middle East, um, or whether it's poverty is now explained in terms of inequality. Uh, every ill, it seems, that our societies suffer from seems to be now blamed on this phenomena of inequality. And, and, and what is inequality? What do we mean when we say inequality? Well, what's conventionally meant by it is basically the gap in income or wealth, or both, between poor people and wealthy people. So the idea is that this gap, this difference in income or in wealth, has causal explanatory power over all these other problems that exist in society. And if only we could shrink this gap, economies would go faster, terrorism would be reduced, maybe even the globe would get a little cooler. Um, that was a joke. But uh, almost every problem, it seems, would go away if only we could. Now, of course, it's true that from the perspective of the global warming crowd, it would get a little cooler because what's the only way to reduce the gap? What is the really the only solution presented in reducing the gap? It's actually to eliminate the people at the top or to, to, to bring them down, right? to redistribute their wealth, to take from those who have and to give to those who don't. Um, there was a, a very well-known book, and I, I assume it came out in Korea because it's out in every language in the world. And, the author is treated as if he's some kind of, um, you know, VIP, uh, by a, a book called Capital in the 21st Century by Thomas Piketty. I don't know if you've heard of this book, but it was a bestseller on Amazon. 
Um, it was uh, hailed as the most important book in economics in the last 20 years by almost every economist out there. He'll get a Nobel Prize in economics for the book, I'm pretty sure. Um, and it, the book documents, or purports to document, the increasing inequality that is happening in countries like the United States and much of Western, Western Europe. He, he has data for, for the last 200 years, and you know this is considered one of the great feats of data collection ever in the book. Um, and he, he says, you know, this is, this is a real problem and it needs to be addressed. And his solution to the problem of inequality is simple. 80% marginal income tax rates at the top. So uh, top tax rate for anybody owning, I think it's over 150,000 euro of about $200,000. 80% of your income is taken, which is actually pretty good because I don't know if you, there was the presidential campaign in France. Um, the election that happened a couple of weeks ago, there were all these there were 12 candidates, and there were four leading candidates, right? And one of the leading candidates was a, was a uh, socialist, or a former communist, or really a communist, right? And he, he got almost 20% of the vote. And his proposal was, if you earn anything over 150,000 euro, you get a marginal tax rate of 100%. So all your money gets taken away from you above 150,000 euro. And he was serious, and he got almost 20% of the vote in France, right? I almost wished that the, that the presidential election right now be, w was between him and Le Pen, because then the French would really get what they deserve. Um, <laughs> either a fascist or a communist, it would be perfect. <laughs> and the French deserve it. Now, not only did he suggest an 80% marginal income tax rate at the top, but he also suggested a 10% wealth tax. So every year, the government would assess your net worth and take 10%. So just to maintain your net worth from year to year, you would have to make on your, uh, you know, on your capital investment more than 10%, or, or you'd have to make 10% exactly. So just to maintain yourself in an environment of 0% interest rates, that would be really, really hard. So basically what Piketty is suggesting is that we take 10% of the wealth and we basically destroy uh, the wealth of, of a whole group of people who, who have it. The argument is, according to Piketty, that unless we do these things, all the wealth over time will accumulate in the hands of a very, very few people and impoverish all the rest of us. All the rest of us will become poorer and the very, very wealthy will become richer so to the extent that at some point they would literally own 100% of all the wealth in the world. And he has this uh, little formula that says that if the return on capital, R, is greater than G, which is the growth in the economy, then all the wealth goes to those who have capital, which is true if R is greater than G forever. Now, there is no, just to be clear, there is no economic theory ever presented that suggests that R will be greater than G forever. It actually contradicts many laws of economics. It doesn't prevent Piketty from arguing that that's the case without presenting any evidence or any argument. Uh, other than there's one other thinker uh, in history who suggested exactly the same thing and who said all the wealth would accumulate in the hands of a few and nobody else would have it. And that was the inevitable consequence of capitalism. Who is that? Karl Marx, who wrote Capital, who, his book was called Capital in the 19th century. This one's called Capital in the 21st century. Well, as I, li I like to call Piketty's book Das Kapital in the 21st century, just to make it clear what he's writing. But he's basically updating Karl Marx. It didn't work under Karl Marx, and there's zero evidence, zero you know, reason why it would actually happen under Piketty. So, these are serious proposals. This is, not, this is not marginal. And again, some people, in at least French politics, have picked up on it. And, and they're serious people like uh, Bernie Sanders in the United States, who, who probably came this close to winning the presidency in the US, um, who, who take this stuff seriously and are seriously talking about 80% marginal income tax rates and 10% wealth taxes as viable, as real things that could happen. 
So people are taking this stuff seriously. Again, you cannot open a, a, a copy of the New York Times newspaper without stories in it every single day about the evil of inequality and the damage that it is doing. Now, I want to be clear, though, that I don't disagree that there are real economic problems in the West, in, you know, you know every, global, every economy in the, in the world, right? That, you know, there are poor people who remain poor and who find real barriers to advance. So there is a problem of what's called mobility, economic mobility. That's real. That's not, that's not pretend. So there are real problems of poverty. And there's real problems of the middle class maybe not growing as fast as one could imagine because economic growth in many Western countries is basically you know, between 0 and 2%, very, very low. And there's, e there's a problem at the top in almost every uh, you know, e modern economy. And the problem at the top is cronyism, is when businessmen basically get involved in politics and where they, they influence the political process for their own well-being. They influence the political process in order to gain unearned benefits to themselves. Use the legal system. Certainly you have that in Korea here. So we have a lot of it in the United States, but every economy has this. So there are real problems in the economy. But this issue of inequality has nothing to do with any of those issues. Indeed, I argue in the book, and I'll argue a little bit here, that every one of the solutions presented for the so-called problem of inequality would make all of those issues worse, not better. All of those issues would be worse, not better. You'd have harder time for poor people, the economy would grow slower if it grows at all, and the people at the top, you would have more cronyism, not less cronyism. Okay. So, in addition, there is no economic theory that connects this gap to any of these problems that exist in the economy. So there's no economic theory, there's no social theory, there's absolutely no justification for what they are doing out there, making this issue of inequality such a big issue. So why do people buy it? What, what, is, what is it about this inequality argument that's appealing? And I think it has to do with a number of fallacies that people hold. Let's talk a little bit, come on in. Talk a little bit about these fallacies. And uh, so what's the first fallacy? Well, the idea is this, and people always use this image, right? We have a big pie. And the pie is the economy. The pie is the wealth in the economy. And now the issue is, how do we divide this pie up? And, and, and it's just like implicitly not fair, it seems, that some people get a big piece of the pie and some people get a little piece of the pie. Right? Because, you know, when, when dad brings a pizza home, and we put the pizza, then it's wrong for some of the kids to get a bigger piece than other, and you know, and there's a lot of fighting about that, because implicitly the assumption is that if dad brings a pizza home, we're gonna get equal shares. We're all gonna get an equal piece. So we have this image of an economy as a pie, and we're all gonna get a piece of that pie, and it should be equal. And, and people, I think, relate to that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I want an equal piece of the pie. What's, what's the problem with that? Yeah, so the first problem, the obvious problem is the pie is finite. It's just a pie. But the fact is the economy grows. Wealth is created. So the pie is constantly growing. So it's not a limited amount that needs to be divvied up, but an unli potentially unlimited amount. And indeed, it is those often who get the bigger piece of the pie who are the ones responsible for making the pie grow. And if you took part of that pie from them, if you made them have a smaller piece, the pie would grow slower. Why is that? Why is it that the people who get the bigger pie, why is it that the wealthy are more responsible for economic growth than the poor? What do the wealthy do with their money? They save it, they invest it, right? so they use their money to create economic activity. But 
most people would say, well, wait a minute, that we have been taught that what really creates economic activity is what? Consumers. Consumption. And who consumes more, rich people or poor people, as a percentage of their income? Poor people. Poor people consume 100% of their income. Rich people have money say, left over. They consume actually very little of their income, and they save and invest most of their income. So the Keynesians would say, we want to shift the pie towards the poor people because they'll, get, they'll consume more, and consumption is what drives the economy. So what's the problem with that? It's not true, yes. That is, that is usually a, good pro a bad problem to have. It's just not true that consumption drives the economy. It's just not true that consumption drives the economy. And it's mathematically, so people say the US economy is 70% consumption. That mathematically is impossible. So think about it. How do you consume? Where do you get the money to consume? What's that? From the other 30%. By taking from other people, right? So what, no, but where do you really get the money to consume? I mean, what? what? Yeah, from your work. So you have to produce, and you get paid for production, and then you can use that money to consume. If you don't produce, put aside redistribution of wealth, then you can't consume. So production has to come first. You have to actually have a job at something whether you're self-employed, whether you work for somebody, to get the money to be able to consume. So at the very least, 50% of the economy has to be production, where you make the money, so that you consume, where you consume the money. Otherwise, it doesn't work. But not only that, when you consume stuff, what are you consuming? Stuff that has already been produced. So what drives an economy is production, the creation of goods and services, the work that people do. Now, yes, you can produce unless somebody is willing to consume it. And yes, once you produce stuff, you then go and consume. So they're not opposites. They're not in, in conflict with one another. But the primary in economics is production, not consumption. What drives an economy is saving and investment. And one of the reasons Asian economies have done so well over the last 40, 50 years is because Asian cultures are saving cultures. Right? One of the reasons economic growth is so low in the United States and one of the reasons we borrow so heavily from China and Japan and everywhere else is because we are a consuming. We consume, which drives actually ultimately drives economic growth down. You need the saving. Now, we, we produce the saving from surplus from other countries. So the investment still happens. But you have to produce in order to consume. So production is primary. So it is the saving and investments of wealthy people that cause economic growth long term. Without saving and investment, there is no economic growth. And this is economics 101. This isn't difficult stuff. It's also easy to get people to consume. All you have to do is give them some money. Much more difficult to get them to actually save and invest and do it wisely. So yeah, so fallacy number one is this pie is finite, and it's not because it's actually growing, and that the growth is made possible because of the surplus that the wealthy have. But even that is a massive distortion of what's actually going on. What's the real fundamental problem with the pie? Lack of ownership of yeah, there is no pie. I mean, you bake a pie, and I bake a pie, and you have a pie. We each bake our own pies through the work and production that we do. And some of us make little pies, and some of us make big pies. But there is no collective pie. You can't take all our pies and mush them all together and pretend that there's a collective pie. <laughs> it isn't there. We actually did this. I, I did an episode of uh, this TV show with uh, Stu. I don't know if you've ever, it's on The Blaze. And he, he interviews you while driving a car, and there are cameras all over the car. And, you, and, he, and he always takes you to a fast food joint. And we were in McDonald's, and we bought a bunch of pies. And then we started mushing them on, on, on camera. And, <laughs> 
So there is no collective pie. Each individual makes his own pie. Each individual works and produces and creates. And the fact is some people create massive pies. That's their pie. It's not society's pie. It's not the government's pie. Nobody has a right to anybody else's pie. And that's the fundamental. It's this whole idea in economics about social wealth or, you know, we have a certain amount of... Uh, of wealth in Korea. No, you don't. There is no Korean wealth. There is no Korean economy in that sense. We like to aggregate in economics, and that's fine if we're just doing economic measurements. So we say the size of the economy is X. Right? But that really is not meaningful. What's meaningful is what is the size of your bank account, wealth, to the extent that you create your own wealth, it's yours. It's not society's. We have to get away from this collectivistic view of economics. So if each one of us makes our own pie, and we understand that the pie I make is mine, then you don't get to redistribute my pie. It's mine. Now, why do some people make big pies? How do you make a big pie? Or in other words, how do you become a billionaire? This is my secret for success. How do you become a billionaire? What does it take to make a billion dollars? In a free market. In a free market. What's that? Make a lot of people's lives better? Yeah, you have to make a lot of people's lives better. Why? Because when you sell something, right? Famous iPhone. When I buy this iPhone for $300, how much is it worth to me? More than $300. More than $300. That's why I'm willing to give it up, right? the 300 bucks and get this. Indeed, much more in the case of an iPhone. Much, much more. So to make a billion dollars is to sell a product like an iPhone to millions or billions of people at a price higher than what it costs you to produce. And if you can do that over and over again to lots of different people, you will make a billion dollars. Right? Now, have you made those people's lives better? Yes, because they got the money and got something with more in return. My life is better for having given up the $300 and gotten an iPhone. Now, notice what happened to inequality when I bought the iPhone. What happens to inequality when I buy the iPhone? It gets bigger because I gave up $300. So Piketty, an economist, looks at my bank account and sees my bank balance shrink. So I got poorer by $300, but he doesn't measure the value of the iPhone. He can't, because he's an economist. He can just do money. He can just do stuff with dollar signs behind it. So the, so the iPhone is not there. If I buy art, he doesn't measure the value of the art. If I, any asset I buy is not measured unless it's a financial asset where there's a dollar sign next to it. So when you buy anything, you become poorer, according to Piketty, and the other party becomes richer and inequality is grown. But that's ridiculous. Because my life is much better for having bought the iPhone for $300 than it was before I bought the iPhone for $300. So my position in life has improved. So how can, in the book we use the example of, uh, you guys read Harry Potter? J.K. Rollins, Harry Potter? I mean, she's a billionaire. How awful is that? Right? I mean, it's terrible because she became a billionaire because of me, right? I have two boys, so every time a book, Harry Potter book came out, I had to buy two copies, right, because they wanted to read them at the same time, right? And then I bought the audio tapes because I wanted to listen to it. And we, we, every book, we did a road trip so I could listen to it. And we all listened to it because they read it. They started reading at midnight when the book came out. And then I would do the road trip and, and listen to it. And then, of course, you had to go to the movies. So I was like, I figure I spent on Harry Potter, what, $1,000, $2,000 at least? So here I am, I became $2,000 poorer, and she became a billionaire. Not fair. It's not fair, right? <laughs> but did my life, was my life worse or better for having given up the $2,000 to get Harry Potter? Much better. I mean, Harry Potter's fun. It, 
it's spiritual fuel. It's entertaining. It's great. It's wonderful. So my life is better. Her life is better. And life's not about money. Life's about what? It's about success and happiness and flourishing as a human being. It's not about money. So yeah, she got richer. I got poorer. But I got more fun. I don't know. I think I benefited more than she did. How do we even measure those things? We can't. And this is why the whole inequality is so silly. So people who make a big pies can only make big pies, can only make a lot of money by making our lives better, by selling us a book that we enjoy reading, by selling us a computer that we, we, we find really productive, by selling us whatever it is that they sell us. We wouldn't buy it unless we believed that our life was going to improve as a consequence. So why would we not penalize people who make big pies? We want to celebrate people who make big pies. We want to celebrate when they make a lot of money. So the big fallacy here is collectivism, is this whole view of viewing everything as a social pie, as everything is social, everything is collective. Right? And you know, President Obama, in probably you know, one of his most famous speeches, you know, articulated kind of the, the, the argument that they make to justify their collectivism. And it's, it's a famous speech that he made that we, we, we call the, you didn't build that speech, right? And here again, the idea is that if you are baking this big pie, you don't get to be responsible for, for the benefits of that big pie. Because you had a great teacher when you were in grade school that made you who you are. And you probably have good genes from your parents. And you probably had a good upbringing and a good education. This is called the argument from luck, which is very prevalent out there. Uh, it was uh, really articulated by John Rawls, a famous uh, American philosopher who died about 10 years ago. And the idea here is you're not responsible for the pie you bake because of all these other factors, external factors. Does that really make any sense? Right? I mean, lots of kids have good teachers. I can't remember a single one of my teachers, so I obviously didn't have any. But, um, but I'm sure some of you had some great teachers. Anybody have a great teacher that really influenced your life? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that if you ever make a lot of money, you should go find the teacher and thank them. And you know, if you want, write them a check. Cool. But it's not like you owe them, right? They did their job, and you benefited from that. That's great. But that was their job. They did it good. That's wonderful. And the fact is that a lot of kids were exposed to that teacher, and she impacted the lives of only a few. And those of you who were impacted should take personal responsibility for the fact that you were open to being impacted. Now, is it true that genes play a role in how successful we are? Sure, but that's reality. That's reality. Some of us are born with, I guess, good genes, and some of us were born with what some would consider bad genes, and that's just nature. But I know lots of people born with good genes who screw it up, and I knew lots of people who were born with bad genes who somehow succeed anyway. Same with parents. Same with whether you're born rich or poor. I know a lot of rich kids who've screwed up their lives completely. And I know a lot of poor kids who've done amazingly well in life. So yes, we're all different. We're all born with different capabilities, with different environments, with different teachers. But it's what you do with what you have that matters. Right? And yet, these other people want to give all the credit to other stuff. Why do they want to give it all the credit to the other? Because that's how they can justify taking it away from you. That's how they can justify socializing it and collectivizing it. If you didn't build it, it's not yours, and I can take it. So they create a whole framework, psychological and philosophical framework, in order to justify taking stuff from you by saying you didn't build that. And that's becoming a very common uh, approach. Even, even people like uh, uh, 
Bill Gates and Warren Buffett believe that they didn't build it. You know, Warren Buffett, go, or, or at least they argue that. I don't know if they believe it or not. But Warren Buffett says all the time, you know, I was born with the right genes to the right parents at the right time. It's all luck. Right? But really, if you think about it, is it? Can it be? Don't we know that some people work harder than other people? Some people really engage their minds and other people don't. Some people really are involved in what they do and some people are not. Unless you're a pure determinist, it's our choices that make us. You know, it's not, yeah, our environment has an influence. Yes, our genes have an influence. But probably the number one influence on your life is the choices you are making every single day. That's what really determines your life. So, the argument about inequality is very much comes from a philosophical foundation of determinism and collectivism. And it's there basically, ultimately, to, to knock down those who are able and successful. And it posits, it posits as an ideal some world with equality, some world of equal outcome. Now, I've never met an inequality critic, somebody who, you know, is, is against inequality, who actually argues that the outcome should be equality. Because they know what that looks like. It's very, very ugly to get to pure equality. But almost all of them believe that equality is a, an ideal. Yeah, human beings are not good enough to attain it, but it's an ideal. It's like a platonic ideal. It's out there, and what we need to do is strive as close to possible to get there. I always ask them, how high, you know, what level of inequality will be okay? So today there's too much inequality. So let's say we shrink it by 20%. Is that good enough? 30%, 50%, 80%, how much? And nobody will ever say a number. Nobody will ever say, this is how much we should shrink it. They refuse. They always say, well, well, we'll you know, we'll know when we get there. <laughs> but we don't, because the fact is that, you know, so Bernie Sanders and people like that always say, look at Scandinavia. Scandinavia has a lot of equality. And you know, what, if you go to Scandinavia, what people are complaining about in Scandinavia? There's too much inequality in Scandinavia. So Swedes want more equality, and the Danish want more equality, right? So there's always you want more. Because if you set up equality as an ideal, even if you acknowledge that you can't actually attain it, you will keep pushing to get to that ideal. So let's think about what that ideal entails, right? So if you look, if you look around this room, or any room, or any, any group of human beings, one of the things you notice is how different we all are, right? Really, really different. As we said, different genes, different backgrounds, different environments, different thinking, different way of approaching the world. We're all different. It, it's one of the things that makes life so cool, so good. I mean, imagine if everybody was the same. Even if everybody was the same as me, that would be really, really, really boring, right? Really boring. So we're all different. So why is it a surprise? that if you take us all different and you leave us free, then we all produce different things. We'll all create different stuff. We all bake different pies, different flavor pies, different size pies. Okay. So in order to make us equal, given the fact that we're metaphysically unequal, what do you have to do? Well, you have to use violence on some in order to correct what nature has provided us, which is inequality. And there's no other way. There's no other way to get equality without violence. So 80% taxes, that's violence. 10% wealth tax, that's violence. Or communism, or any regime that has ever attempted to bring about equality has had a resort to violence. I mean, maybe the best example of this ever was, um, was in the 1970s. A group of intellectuals who had studied in France under the, we, we talked about existentialists, they'd studied under the existentialists, uh, uh, under the egalitarians in Paris at the Sorbonne, 
under Camus and Sartre and uh, Fuqua and all these guys. And, uh, and they, they went to their country of origin and they managed to gain political control. And they said, okay, we're going to implement egalitarianism in our country. So we're going to establish equality. So the people living in the city and people living in the countryside. So what do, you, what, do you, what do you have to do in order to get people to be equal if some are living in the city and some are living in the countryside? That's not equal. Right? Move them all to the country. Yeah, get everybody out of the cities. Say, so literally, forced everybody out of the cities into the countryside. But then you have a problem of feeding them <coughs> because all these people are in the countryside and there's no food. And it turns out that when you leave people out there in the countryside with nothing, some of them are good at finding food and some of them are bad at finding food. So again, there's inequality. And some of them are smart and some of them are educated and some of them wear glasses, which is a sign, I guess, of you can read and, and, and you're educated maybe, right? So what do you do? All these people are, they're unequal. How do you get them equal? What would they do? Just kill them? Well, you kill them. <laughs> you kill them. You kill anybody with glasses, you kill anybody with an education, you kill anybody who's a good forager of food, you basically kill them. This is the killing fields of Cambodia, where they killed almost 40% of the population. They killed 2 million people out of 5 or 6 million. And the criteria was, if you were special in any regard, if you were unequal, in any sense, you were a little bit better at something or other, you were shot. That's what inequality, that's what the whole striving towards equality really means. The only way to level us is by chopping down anybody who sticks out. And there's no end to that. Right? If the Kamerouj had been allowed to continue, they would have wiped out everybody pretty much. Right? Of course, they were well educated and they wore glasses and they had plenty of food, but you know, it never applies to the ruling class who's implementing the strategy. Right? So the ideal of equality is what needs to be crushed, what needs to be destroyed. It's a bad ideal. The only idea of equality that makes any sense is the idea of political equality. The idea that we're all equal in our freedoms, we're all equal in our liberties, we're all equal in our rights. We all have, as human beings, a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We all have a right to be left free to pursue our own values, the rational values that we need in order to thrive as human beings. That's the kind of equality that is real, that is meaningful. And what happens when you give that equality to people? You get massive inequality of wealth and massive inequality of income. Who cares? It makes no difference. So there is a problem of inequality, but it's inequality of rights and inequality of freedom. And there is an ideal of equality, and that ideal is equality, political equality, equality of rights and equality of liberty. And that's what we should be fighting for. And we shouldn't take seriously this nonsense about equality of outcome in any regard. Thank you all. All right. Questions on anything? Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> he, so, he was eager. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you win. Um, what, is, what are your thoughts on why people focus on wealthy business people as opposed to wealthy, like people don't get angry about wealthy actors or athletes to the same extent as they do hedge fund managers? Well, I've heard Stossel's theory. What's theory? Stossel's theory? Uh, his, his theory is that with athletes, uh, we can see what they do yeah. and we know yeah. we can't do it. I think he got that from me. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if he got that from me. Um, yes, I think, look, all of us have played basketball, right? We've all dribbled a ball and shot at a basket. And we know how pathetic we are at it. And we see LeBron James and we go, whoa, he can really do it, right? And we know how hard it is. And it's fun to watch him and we get entertained. So he gets $100 million, who cares, right? because we're being entertained, and we get what he does, and we get that what he does is hard because we tried it, and we can't do it, right? And 
there are a few actors that make a lot of money, not a lot, right? Most actors make very little money. It's like the few superstars make a huge amount of money. And again, we're entertained by them. And we smile or we say we're sad or we're, you know, usually just depressed after going to one of their movies, right? Um, not because the movie's depressing, because. Uh, so the fact that they're making a lot of money you know, doesn't trouble us because we see the benefit we get. But what the hell does a hedge fund manager even do? A He's a paper shuffler, right? And from, from at least 2,000 years, we've been taught that finance guys are just crooks, right? It's just they're all thieves. They just, they just manipulate paper and they manipulate stuff and they, they make money from money. Even Aristotle thought that was bad, right? Because money was barren, he would say. Money doesn't create children, right? It can't multiply like seeds or, or animals. So money shouldn't be able to make more money. So he didn't understand, right? But we have this perception of how can a finance guy benefit my life? No. We actually, when we look at businessmen, we actually perceive it as zero-sum game. Hey, I, I'm $300 poor because I bought an iPhone. Now, it's easy to explain the iPhone, and that's why people have some sympathy towards Apple, and they kind of like Apple, and Apple's okay, right? But it's those evil finance guys, because finance is a higher-level abstraction, and it's more difficult to understand. So if you produce something concrete, you can hide behind that concrete product, like, like the iPhone or Microsoft software or something, and we all use it. But what do you do when you do finance? Or what do you do when you do IP law? How do you, how do you, you, know, how do you explain that? It's very abstract. Now, if you study economics, or you study these things, you know that you can't have an iPhone without hedge funds, ultimately, right? So without a robust, free, dynamic financial industry, there is no production of real products. But that's a high level of abstraction that very few people ever reach. And nobody talks about it, including the financiers. They never defend themselves. And we have a, this culture since Jesus threw the money changes out of the temples, right, of uh, uh, suspicion about, about money and, and about bankers and about finance. And, and there you have it. So the more abstract what you do is, the more difficult it is for people to get, the more they resent it. And then remember, the intellectuals are constantly telling people, those, it's those guys over there. They're at fault. They did it. They screwed you. Right? So it's reinforced constantly by the intellectual class. And they're at the end of the day at fault. Because at least in America in the old days, people didn't resent people with money. They didn't resent wealth. They only started resenting wealth when they were taught to resent wealth by the intellectuals. Other questions? I saw another hand. Yeah. Korea is right now the world's fastest aging society. And because it is fast. You're aging faster than Japan? It is faster than Japan. Wow. And so there are already more senior citizens than there are young people in Korea today. Yeah. And so because of this whole inequality topic that, that you brought up, one of the solutions that more and more people are bringing up is the basic income. Yep. And what is the objective is Yeah. But considering how unproductive these senior citizens are going to be as they grow older, what is the ideal solution in that case? Well, but aren't the senior citizens already getting kind of a social security and, and so they're being taken care of? You don't need a basic. See, the, pro, the issue of basic income doesn't seem to me as, as targeted at solving the problem of old age because they've already got commitments in America through Social Security, and I know in Japan, and here I think you have also the equivalent of Social Security. So they're getting a basic income already. And, uh, sorry, but I, I think Korea does have the highest elderly poverty rate in the OECD, and a lot of elderly people get very, very little. But aren't they they're getting stuff from the government? They're just getting very little from the government? Very, very little. Okay, so, 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 so the argument is should we increase that? It's not whether we need, because in a sense, the base, the basic income solution is being presented to a different problem, in my view. And the problem that the basic income is supposed to solve is, and this is why it's a hot deal in Silicon Valley these days, you know what basic income is? It's where we guarantee everybody in society, young, old, everybody, a minimal you know, $12,000 a year. You just get a check. No other welfare, no other redistribution of wealth, but you get everybody in society gets a minimal income from the government. 
The reason that's being promoted in the United States at least, and I think globally, by, by technology companies, is because of, of this notion that soon robots are going to replace all the work, and young people are going to be unemployed, and therefore young people are going to need a basic income. So the idea is that this is a solution to this so-called problem of, un of, of systemic unemployment that's just around the corner. By the way, it's been just around the corner since about 1796, <laughs> right? When the first you know, machine started replacing human beings. Just around the corner, they, nobody would have a job. Just around the corner. It's just going to happen any day now. And, and why people, st but the, and every 10 years, somebody comes up and says, no, 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 but this time it's different which is what they're saying now in Silicon Valley. Give me a break. Um, so that's, I think, the basic income. So what do you do about an older population? I mean, I don't think you do anything about it. So, you know, the poor, you know, the poor. I mean, that's, that's, that's the reality. They should have saved, right? They should have saved when they were working. But because the government has promised to take care of everybody, people don't save. So the whole idea of saving for retirement is out the window because why save for time? I'm going to get Medicare, I'm going to get Social Security, I'm going to get all these benefits from the government, and people forget that the benefits are not that big. In America, Social Security is very little. You can't live off of Social Security very well. Actually, you live on it very, very poorly. <coughs> so unless you save, you're in deep trouble, and you're going to see large rates of poverty among American old people once this baby boom generation retires because they haven't saved. Right? Now, if you're in the upper middle class or if you're rich, you've saved, but everybody else hasn't saved because they've been told since they were little, don't save, what's the point? You're getting Social Security. So, you know, this is a, the problem of a, of a shrinking population, um, you know, is, is, a, is a problem of, of young people, not of old people, right? What are young people going to do? More and more of their income is going to be taken away from them to be given to old people. This is a problem everywhere in the world, in Japan, here, and in the United States. And in Germany, I mean, people think German economy is in good shape. Just wait 10 years. German economy is in deep, deep trouble because Germany is, again, shrinking. Why do you think they want immigrants? Right? Why do you think Germany opens their borders up for all these immigrants? Because they need young people. Because they don't have enough of their own. So the Germans are smart enough, maybe they're not being the right immigrants, but they're smart enough to at least realize that they need young people. The Japanese have zero immigration, so they're in deep, deep trouble because they don't have any, they don't have kids. So they don't have a young generation that is going to pay the Social Security for the older generation. I, I don't know what the immigration policy in Korea is. My guess is that it's pretty tight, that you don't, yeah, you don't allow immigrants. You know, that's, that's not good. That's not a good, you know, situation. Now, ultimately, the solution is to have more kids. But that I don't, you know, that's a more difficult uh, problem to solve. And you have to ask the question. I think, I think it's, a, it's an important question for, because it's not just, uh, it's not just Korea and Japan, and Japan. This is in, uh, in Italy, Spain, Russia, uh, and, and Germany, and much of kind of central and southern Europe. People don't have kids. Russia is shrinking almost as fast as Korea and Japan in terms of the size, right? And we really have to ask why. Why are people not having kids? Because I think it is a cultural indicator. I, I think it says something about a culture when you stop having children. Not any individual couple having children, but as a culture, suddenly this becoming a phenomenon. Um, it, you know, it makes economic growth more difficult, and it, it makes funding social programs more difficult. But the social programs were unjust to begin with. Right? Now we're just, we're going to make them even more unjust because you're going to put a greater and greater burden on a smaller and smaller population of young people who are actually working for the sake of funding older people. But the old people have no claim over the young people. So it's not like we, we, we need to secure them more income at the expense of young people. I mean, that, that's unjust. That doesn't make any, that's not fair, right? So the solution is, the solution is immigration in the short run. And long term, uh, you know, the solution is to wind down the welfare programs, wind down and encourage people to save for retirement and take responsibility for their own lives. The other problem, so-called problem, in quotes, right, is, is longevity. We're living to be very, very old, right? 
You guys will live to be 100, many of you, right? So we have this artificial thing about retiring at 65. Why would you retire at 65 if you're going to work another, if you're going to live another 35 years? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. But we've artificially established it. In some countries, in Europe, you retire at 55 or 60. And then what do you do? And, and, and now you're living off of your children and grandchildren for half of your life. So, so a little bit of your life you work, like you're a kid for the first 20 years, and then you work for a little while, and then you mooch off of your kids and grandkids. I mean, that's not just. And if literally your kids and grandkids had to write the checks, they wouldn't let you retire. <laughs> right? So if you're older, what you've done is you, you've, you've, you're using the government to hide the fact that you're leeching off of your kids and grandkids. So the whole system has to blow up. The whole system is corrupt. The whole system is immoral. The whole welfare redistribution social security system is completely immoral, and it has to go away, and that's the only solution long term uh, to making it go away. Now, you can't just make it go away like that because you've got all these old people who are dependent on it, but you can start phasing it out so you don't perpetuate the problem forever. And you have to start encouraging young people to save. And what that'll do is in the short run, it will actually lower their, their standard of living. Because not only will they have to pay taxes to pay for old people, but they'll also have to save, and then their consumption is going to have to go down. And that means a lower standard of living for young people for a while, so that they can not only pay off all the obligations that have been made, but also save enough money so they can retire one day. But we have to get rid of this notion of 65 as a retirement age, and, and, and a lot of these notions that were created really during the Great Depression. And, and why was Social Security in America established at 65? Anybody know? Yeah, I think because I think cause the, the people are going to be dying off. Yeah, because almost nobody lived to be 65. So it's pretty safe to promise stuff after you were 65 if you were going to die before that. Right? So is. So everybody worked until 65, which is pretty much when you died anyway, because life expectancy was around, you know, low 60s. But now life expectancy is 85. So why isn't the retirement age adjusted? At least somewhat. Well, because once you give people goodies, it's almost impossible to take them away. Yeah. And they're on course to become a minority. And if, if you look around the world, if you look at the tension between Europe, if you look at the tensions in Israel, the racial tensions you see in South Africa, and also in America, and then you come to Korea and Japan, which are ethnically homogenous, yeah. isn't there huge social and economic benefits for societies to remain ethnically homogenous? I don't see why. I mean, Israel is not an ethically homogenous uh, society, and, uh, and the problems that Israel faces have nothing to do with the fact that it's not homogeneous ethnically. I mean, my wife and I are not the same ethnicity. We're the same 2,000 years ago. We come from the same Jewish mother, but, you know, that's 2,000 years ago. She, she's different color skin. She comes from a completely different culture. She eats different food than I do. Uh, I mean, not anymore. Now we've kind of, you know, merged the, the ethnicities together. <laughs> But there's no, there's no, there's, there's nothing, you know, America, I mean, to say America's ethnically homogeneous in the 1960s is ridiculous. The Poles hated the Irish, and the hated, Irish hated the, the Italians. I mean, Italians were scum, and they started mafias, and they had dark skin. Nobody liked them, not to mention the Greeks. Yeah, I mean, what makes, what makes you white? I mean, there's no whiteness. There's no such thing. It's bullshit. The whole thing is bullshit. Well, but that's bullshit. I mean, with all due respect to Koreans, if you look at your genome, those of you are Koreans, and you look at the Japanese genome, and you look at the Chinese genome, the differences are non-existent. Oh, sure. But you wouldn't be Asian. No, but, 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 but you think. You think I wouldn't be Asian. But it turns out that I am. No, I'm, I'm not kidding. 
I'm not kidding. So I did 23andMe. 23andMe is you, you spit into a test tube and they, they run, you do your genome for you, right? And they, they give you the diseases you're susceptible to. But one of the things that they do is they tell you where your ancestors lived 800 years ago. So where the snippet of genes from your DNA was 800 years ago, where does it originate from? And it turns out that on my father's side, my genome originates from northern Siberia, right? Asia, A. Eh? And that I have more in common from that perspective with American Indians than I do with Europeans. That's my genes, right? So the whole whiteness thing is complete and utter nonsense. It's nonsense. Is this kind of similar to the argument from the left that race is a social construct? Race is a social construct. It is. I agree with the left. What can I do? I, 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 race, I mean, I don't believe races exist. Yeah, we have different colors of skin, but race is an insignificant, irrelevant, silly idea uh, that, that needs to be wiped off the face of the earth. And, and I think will be because we, there's so much intermarriage. So, uh, so uh, what are our kids? So when, so when, when my kids were born uh, in, in Texas, um, this nurse walks in, right? She's black and she walks in with this, uh, she's filling out the birth certificate for my kid. And you know the name and the thing, address, race. And I looked at her and I said, what are we, in Nazi Germany? I, what's it any business, you know, I don't even know what the term means, race. What race am I? I don't know what race I am. I'm Northern European for whatever, you know, mostly. But it turns out now that I'm actually Northern Siberian. But wh what does it even mean? She says, look, I can't give you a birth certificate unless you give me a race. I said, okay, write whatever the hell you want. Because my wife's mother was born in Morocco. What does that make her? African? My wife's father was born, was born in Palestine, but his ancestors were born in Uzbekistan. That makes him an Asian. So it makes my kid a quarter African, a quarter Asian, and a quarter Northern Europe, and a half Northern European. What does that mean? What are my kids? What, what race are my kids? What race? Jewish? Jewish is not a race. Jewish is a religion. And do you find in Israel that they're becoming more open to the idea of open borders and uh, a large amount of people? No, because, because the people who want to come into Israel are going to kill everybody who's in Israel. So why would you let people in who want to kill you? Right? But, but the fact is that, that it used to be that there was a lot of racism in Israel. Right? We European Jews look down our nose at Moroccan Jews and it's and it, uh, and it, uh, and non-European Jews, and we discriminated against them. Clearly, there was discrimination. Now, that is disappearing, partially because of intermarriage and partially because of the stupidity of it, and people become rational over time in some cases. But, but so, uh, and, and, you know, there's even intermarriage between Muslims and Arabs and, 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 uh, and Jews, but we're not different races. Is, are Jews and Arabs different races? It's the same race. We all come from the same, like if you go back to the Bible, half of us come from one son of, of uh, uh, Jacob. Jacob, was it? And, and uh, uh, one is Ahab and one is, is Isaac. And we, we, we're cousins. We're all the same. You know, all Jews and Arabs, all the same. We call each other cousins. So, so what are the races? So let's open up the borders to all the people in the same race, which means all the Muslims can come in and slaughter us. So Israel's a special case in terms of open borders because Israel's surrounded by people who want to destroy it and the people inside Israel have to be committed to its defense. So it has to be people who clearly view the state of Israel as an idea. But if Israel, if we lived in a, you know, in a, an objectivist heaven, right, if everybody was, uh, was a freedom-loving, pro-individual rights person, then absolutely Israel should have open borders. No, nobody, nobody crossing the border into the United States wants to slaughter Americans. I mean, there's a big difference between Israel and 90% of all countries in the world. Yeah, but the difference is this, that if two million Chinese came to Israel, and I don't want to spend the whole time talking about this, but if, if, if Israel had a policy of bringing in two, the Chinese are not going to fight for Israel. Israel needs people who are willing to fight for its existence. 
And right now, given the situation in the world right now, the only people willing to fight for Israel's existence are Jews. And that's why it has that policy. But if the enemy disappeared, if there was no enemy to Israel, then yeah, bring in two million Chinese, who cares? As long as they're right to, as long as, you know, Israel's a, a healthy country, a good country, I don't care what, what color skin you have or what slanted eyes you have or whatever. It, it, what, what, what relevance does that have to individual human freedom? What, what, what relevance does skin color have to any of this stuff? And the Chinese, you know, for those who believe in IQ studies, have very similar IQs to Ashkenazi Jews. So, cool, we can all have high IQs. I mean, the whole thing is stupid. I mean, I don't believe in IQs. Uh, racially categorized people based on IQs. I don't believe in using that as a criteria to let people in or out. It, the, whole, the whole way of, you know, what you need is a free country and people but should come. Fine, die out. I mean, that's the alternative. It, that's fine. I mean, I mean, you have a shrinking economy with no immigration and, and have a lot of old poor people and a lot of young people who are being taxed to death because they have to support old people because you're not having enough kids. So fine. I mean, so be it. I mean, that's the reality. But, but the fact is that I would like to see a world in which people can, and because I think that you have a right to travel any way you want and to live any way you want to live, as long as you're not a threat to the people around you. As long as you're not, and a threat means a physical threat, uh, a violent threat. Israel can't have open borders because the people would come in would kill people. Uh, Mexicans don't kill people in America. Not at any, at low, they, they, they do, but at much lower rates than Americans do. So, so, <laughs> what's that? No, in terms of the percentage, a proportion of a population, they're much lower. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yes, but the fact, again, the statistics show, and uh, you know, we could debate statistics all day long, that uh, most immigrants, an overwhelming majority of immigrants, including illegal immigrants into the United States, do not consume more welfare than they actually pay in, uh, into the system. But, but you're right. I mean, let's do away with welfare. I'm all for doing away with welfare. And, and I'm not proposing tomorrow to open up borders. But, the, but what I'm proposing that every country in the world should think about and do is increase the number of immigrants into those countries. Certainly the United States needs immigrants. And the way I would increase immigration is if you can find a job, you should be allowed in. Give them five-year visas, and renewable, they don't have to become citizens. You don't have to give them citizens. Give people five-year visas to come to work. And every country should do that. And Japan should do that. And Korea should do that. Because that's necessary for economic growth. And it's necessary for economic prosperity. But it's also a right. People have a right to, I have a right to employ whoever I want to employ. And if I want to employ a bunch of Mexicans, it's none of your business. And if I want to employ a bunch of, you know, green head people, it's none of your business. A bunch of people with IQs below 90, it's none of your business. As long as they're not a physical threat to you, then it's none of your business who I employ. So uh, it, it's an issue of individual rights. Uh, so uh, do we tomorrow eliminate borders? No, of course not. But do we make it much easier for people to cross borders in order to work, in order to be productive? Absolutely. And, and the whole world needs that. And by the way, Israel has a, a huge number of guest workers. Huge number of guest workers in Israel, Filipinos and Thais and Indians and all kinds of people come to Israel to work and they get work visas. And they work because, you know who used to do the work in Israel? Palestinians. All, all the construction works, all the construction jobs, all the works at hospitals and places like that used to be done by Palestinians. When they got radicalized and they got suicidal, then Israel had to replace them and they replaced them with guest workers from other places. So Israel is not a particularly closed border kind of place. So I'm, I'm not, I have no problem. I've always said uh, make it easy for people to come and make it hard for them to become citizens. But, but the idea that, 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 that these racial identities are meaningful 
or that they need to be preserved is, I think, ludicrous and irrational. Yeah. Can I go back to the class? Yes. Yep. What tends to happen, I guess, the reason why a lot of people are angry at the rich uh, is because there has been theft and corruption. Yes. And yes. And it, it happens. Mm -hmm. So how does one take this idea um, and then, like, wait, what's the solution? Do we focus on correcting corruption? Uh, or so first we have to admit, as you're saying, that there are people who reach the top because of corrupting the system, rigging the, rigging the game. So we have to first acknowledge that fact. And then you have to ask the question, well, what is the way in which you unrig the system? How do you actually eliminate cronyism? So how do you eliminate cronyism? Eliminate the power of the government? Oppressive power? Yeah, the only way to eliminate cronyism is to get rid of government control over the economy. The more government control has over the economy, the more the companies, the entities, the individuals in the economy are going to try to influence the government. And it's a game. And once you set the game in motion, it's going to continue forever, and there's no way to stop it. You can't take money out of politics. It, you know, there's always a path for money to flow into politics. If. So what you have to do is eliminate the power of politicians over the economy. It's the only way to make that kind of change. And, and my favorite story here is Microsoft. Some of you might have heard this. I've told it many times. Uh, in, uh, in the mid-1990s, Microsoft spent, ex it was the biggest company in the world, the most productive, creative, fastest growing company in the world, and it was spending zero dollars on lobbying in Washington. Nothing. Uh, and they were brought in front of the Senate, and Armin Hatch, uh, a, a senator from Utah, still in the Senate today, Republican, yelled at them. And he said, you guys have to stop spending money in Washington. You have to build a building in Washington. You have to hire lawyers. You have to have a lobby. In other words, you guys have to bribe me. Right? And Microsoft, in the, literally in the meeting, they said, look, you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. We're not interested. We're not going to spend a dime in Washington. We've got, we're busy. We're changing the world. And literally, they were changing the world, right? Leave us alone. So, so what happened? You know, a few months later, knock on the door, we're from the Justice Department, and we're here to break you up. What was the crime Microsoft had committed? Giving away a browser for free. Giving away a browser for free in the days when we, old enough to remember, had to pay $70 to get Netscape. Yeah, yeah right? And, and they were giving Internet Explorer for free. Bundled in the, you know, the bundled was the keyword, right? So what did Microsoft learn from that? And, and by the way, that lawsuit took 10 years. Add another 10 years of resolution. Microsoft was destroyed. It's never been the same company, never been. And, and Bill Gates left, and a big part of why Bill Gates left is because of the government involvement in running Microsoft, right? So, um, what was I saying? Yeah, so what did they learn from it? Lobby. Lobby like crazy. So they spend tens of millions of dollars today a year. They've got a beautiful building about equal distance from the White House and Congress. Right? Glass building, gorgeous. I've spoken in that building. Um, and look at Google. Google from day one, from day one, was giving out money to politicians. Apple didn't learn too well, so the antitrust division has gone after Apple. Right? They, they, right? Google. Nobody's ever gone after Google. They, they went after them in Europe, but in America, they're untouched. Even though they have, what, 90-something percent of the search in, in, on the Internet and, and advertising on the Internet, and nobody goes after them? How, how, come, how did that happen? Right? Because they bribe the right people. And they give a lot of money to Republicans and a lot of money to Democrats, so they, they, they dish it out to everybody, so they, they've got it. They figured it out. So the way to stop it is to get the government out of business. Government should not be in the business of business. So they should no, then there will be no motivation. If you don't regulate, then there won't be, there won't be you know, uh, cronyism. And that's why it's so hard, because how do we get the government out? And until we do, it won't change. You know? and, and you can, you know, the government here in Korea is very involved in the world of business. Business is very well involved in the world of government.
And, and that's true in every country around the world because of that. Yeah. And No, because automation creates jobs. It doesn't destroy them. Automation has never destroyed jobs in history. It always creates more jobs than it destroys. So, you know, now look, there's, no, there's nothing in reality that says that the population has to increase all the time. I mean, the population can be stable or even decreasing. Um, that's fine, and you can still have a rising standard of living with that. But you can't run that and a welfare state. Right? Because the welfare state, the whole point of the welfare state is to take from those who produce to give to those who don't. As the population gets older, those who don't increase their numbers and those who produce shrink. That's why you need immigrants. So in a, in a, in a, uh, in a free world, it's not clear that the population of the world would increase. I, I think it would because I think, I think there's value in having babies. And I think uh, it's a sign of a culture's unhealth when they don't have babies. So I think there's something fundamentally problematic in Korea and Japan and Italy and, and in a lot of these countries that is preventing people from having babies and one should think about that. And I think that's interesting. I don't have the answer, but, but there's something unhealthy about that culturally. It's a sign of, of decay. Um, so, but you know, maybe, maybe all we want is one child and therefore the population of the world will shrink. It doesn't matter if we're now redistributing wealth. It does matter if we are redistributing wealth. Right? So as long as you're redistributing wealth, you need young people. Whether you get them through birth or whether you get them through immigration, you need them. The robots don't solve the problem because the robots create jobs. I mean, think of all the jobs that exist today that didn't exist 50 years ago. That I, none of you could have imagined would exist. I, I don't know if any of you can think of any. Well, yeah. I mean, entertainment's massive. Social media. Social media. Games. Gaming. Right? Computer games. I mean, you know how many hundreds of thousands of people work in the gaming industry? Designing and writing code and marketing and creating games. And playing games professionally. And playing games professionally. Even more bizarre. <laughs> right? right? But, but, but go outside of that. Think about things that... Bec why has the entertainment industry grown so much? More free time? Yeah, we have more free time because we work actually less. We're wealthier, so we can afford to pay for entertainment, which we couldn't 50 years ago, certainly not 100 years ago. But it's not just that. Think about how many restaurants there are today and how many fancy restaurants there are today. Right? There's a whole culture now of, of celebrity chefs you know, you have celebrity chefs here in, 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 uh, in Seoul, right? Couldn't get a reservation. I tried both restaurants and I couldn't get a <laughs> I mean, it's true. It completely, one completely ignored me and the other one said, you know, they only open up a month in advance and you, you literally have to be on speed dial when they open up the reservation to try to get a reservation. And I couldn't do it, so, uh, so I, didn't, I, I, I didn't get in. They don't know who I am, so uh, <laughs> that is guaranteed. But yeah, I have, I have a list of, uh, I have this list of 50 best restaurants in the world, right? And then, uh, and then the same publication puts out a list of the 50 best restaurants in Asia, and the two restaurants here in Seoul on that list, and I tried to get a reservation to both of them and couldn't, couldn't get in. So, um, I mean, who would have thought, that I would have never thought 10 years ago that I would care about getting into, into a top 50. It shows how rich I am in a sense, right? And how, you know, how our pleasures have evolved. Like 20 years ago, I wouldn't have appreciated a really good restaurant. But we now have the time and the will to be able to learn to appreciate what really, really good food tastes like. And the whole ambiance, it's not just the food, it's the, it's a, have you seen how they plate these things? The beauty, you know, the aesthetic of it. I mean, but, but 100 ye 200 years ago, we were barely eating. Right? Now we can enjoy the pleasure of just the look of the food. Right? And we only locally source the food. And, you know, the chefs go out into the wild and pick berries. 
They're very special berries. I mean, it's, the whole thing is ridiculous if I think about it, right? And yet I pay hundreds of dollars to go and eat at places like this and love it. So that's a profession that didn't exist, and it will exist much more of it in the future. And who knows what we will enjoy 50 years from now that we can't even imagine we would enjoy. Right? So the number of professions, the amount of entertainment, the amount. So, so if robots arrive, we'll only work 30 hours a week, or maybe only 20 hours a week. So imagine how much leisure time we will have to do all the other things that we want to do. And there have to be people I'm, I'm allowing us to do all that leisure activity, and that's where partially where all the jobs will be. So it's, it's impossible to predict, but robots don't destroy jobs, they create them. Just like every other technology has in human history. There's never been a case where technologies actually, on net, destroy jobs. You said earlier uh, that you were on the road maybe 150 days last year. So yeah. what keeps you going? What's your own personal motivation for getting out here and having a <laughs> talk to it? Well, I mean, I... I like us. Especially <laughs> if you can't get into the restaurant. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> I know. It's tough. There's, there's a restaurant in London that I've been trying to get in for three years, and I can't get in. It's ridiculous. And I go to London a lot. So I love these ideas. I think they're incredibly powerful, incredibly uh, uh, um, powerful for the individual, for, to making your life as individuals better. Um, and uh, and they're, they're incredibly empowering. And of course, culturally and society-wide, I, I think they're, you know, they're world-changing. And they have the potential to really have a huge impact on the world. I'm a teacher at heart. What I love is to teach and educate. And, and so I love being able to engage with people with ideas and, and get them to change their lives as a consequence or improve their lives even a little bit. That's what makes my day. That's, you know, so. Um, and uh, I, I am blown over by the fact that objectivism, Ayn Rand, has become a global phenomenon. Um, you know, 10 years ago, again, one of these things 10 years ago I couldn't have imagined, couldn't have imagined it just 10 years ago. That, that I'd be in Korea talking about Ayn Rand, or in, uh, I just came back from Albania and Montenegro and Macedonia, right? Albania is like 70% Muslim, and, and here I am, you know, speaking about Ayn Rand, and these people are telling me, yeah, Ayn Rand changed my life. And, you know, the, 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 the first president of Albania coming out of communism, the guy who fought communists and established, you know, was the first president out of communism, right? Told me that uh, it, it, the two people inspired him most to, to do what he did was uh, Ronald Reagan and Ayn Rand in Albania. You know, that's like, I couldn't have imagined that. But it turns out that there's a lot of that that happened under communism. She was incredibly influential, much more influential than any of us imagined now that kind of the history's coming out. Um, but I, just, I, find that, I find it inspiring and fun and, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm motivated by trying to change the world. And even though I realize that I won't, right? that the change will happen well after I'm gone, um, I still love the fact that there's progress and we're moving in that direction and we're impacting people and, and lives are changing. And I have kids, so once you have kids, your, your horizon changes because you know, your, your, your horizon gets lengthened. It's part of, the, part of the fun of having kids. You start to think even longer term than just your own life. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that, I mean, I'm motivated by, and I love, Again, I love the ideas and I love the exchange. Um, yeah. Uh, so we had a question from an objectivist group member that couldn't be here today. Sure. Um, so Piketty has this use case graph that shows income inequality really high in the 30s, 40s, and then like dipping <laughs> after World War II. No, no, it's really high in the 20s, in, in the late 19th century, and then in the early in the 20s. By the 30s, it's starting to shrink. Economies or mixed economies? Or no, it's very simple why inequality declines, right? And Piketty says it in the book. Great Depression, who, whose wealth gets destroyed in the Great Depression? People who have it. The stock market went down 95%. So if you had capital in the stock market, you, it plummeted in terms of wealth. So the, the top got eviscerated, right? And what happened right after the Great Depression? A world war. If you blow up stuff, inequality goes down. 
So inequality went down because we basically destroyed a huge amount of wealth through depression and through a war. Um, now, it was maintained at low level through massive redistributions of wealth, which then drove a lot of countries in Western Europe bankrupt, which then had, they had to liberalize their economy. So free markets create e inequality. Late 19th century, large inequality, because there was freedom. Freedom creates inequality. That's why inequality is a good thing, not a bad thing, because it's a sign that you're living under freedom. What destroys inequality, what brings about equality, is anything that increases poverty. War is great if you don't want inequality. World War II flattened the inequality, the, his curve, dramatically. And, and Krugman is known as saying, yeah, what we need is a war. Wars are good. They create economic activity, he thinks, right? And they flatten the inequality. So if you really want to solve the inequality problem, then have a world war. I mean, imagine what would happen if, if North Korea started uh, bombarding South Korea. Uh, inequality in South Korea would go down. Because the poor would still be poor, so they'd still be here, but the rich would lose a lot of wealth. So inequality, Gini coefficients would improve. So war is good for Gini coefficients. That's why the whole debate about inequality is so sick, in my view, because the only way to reduce inequality is to do violence. Wars, depressions, and you know, Khmer Rouge, communism, uh, theft, 80% marginal income tax rates, uh, wealth taxes. It has to be violence that reduces. Freedom encourages, and people tell me, you know, I'll be at this conference, I'm actually giving a talk on inequality at this conference. There will be people there, the libertarians, who will be there who will say, capitalism reduces inequality. And that's just not true. And, and the, my, my answer to that is, who cares? I don't care about inequality one way or the other. Inequality is irrelevant. What I care about is freedom. And freedom might increase inequality or it might reduce inequality. But what I know freedom does is if you take the people at the bottom, their lives improve. Maybe not at the very bottom, because some people, their lives won't improve. But most people's lives will improve. Some will improve very fast and some will improve very slow. But everybody's lives. So if you go back, if you go back 200 years, if, if you go back 300 years, how many people were poor? Yeah, 95% relative poverty, right? 95 to 96% of humanity was earning less than $3 a day. Now imagine life at $3 a day. I'm talking about today's dollars. Right? So it used to be the 90 plus percent of the people on the planet earned less than $3 a day. How many, how many people today on the planet earn less than $3 a day? 8%. It's gone down. Over the last 30 years, it went from 30% to 8%. Almost 2 billion people came out of poverty over the last 30 years, which nobody talks about. So global inequality has actually shrunk while inequality in the United States has increased. Global inequality has shrunk because the poor have gotten richer. Right? OK, so $3 a day, everybody's poor. So there's no, there's no inequality. Right? And then what happens? Then you get, you get, you get capitalism, and you get this. Everybody gets richer. Some people get richer faster than others. So suddenly you've got a gap. But everybody's richer. What, how can we complain about that? That's like something to celebrate. Um, about that global inequality issue, that was actually going to be like my next question yeah. anyway. Why do people focus on national borders when it comes to inequality and not on because people focus on what they want to focus on, what, what will present the, the best case that they have for the argument that they want to make. It's not about reality and truth. I mean, Piketty in the book admits that global inequality has gone down. That's, he's not worried about, he doesn't care about poor people. I mean, the myth is that they, he even says in the book, he says, the, 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 all these taxes that I want to inflict, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna help poor people that I have these taxes. Because it's not enough wealth to redistribute to all the poor people to make them wealthier. So it's not going to help them. It's going to knock down the rich. Inequality will shrink. That's what he cares about. So they're motivated by a resentment of success and by envy and by hatred. They're not motivated by the love of poor people. 
They don't care one. I mean, Piketty's like an old aristocratic family from, from France. He's, he's got a good academic job. Now he makes $100,000 a speech. He's not, you know, you know, Paul Krugman was, uh, once gave a speech on inequality, the evil of inequality, and he charged $250,000 for the speech. <laughs> I mean, that's not a joke. That's reality. These people don't care. Right? Like, he didn't give that $250,000 charity immediately. Right? It's, like, it's like Bernie Sanders has three, uh, three houses. I think it's three houses. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Michael I mean, and, and you can say they're hypocrites, but it doesn't matter, you know, because they don't really care about the poor. If they really cared about the poor, they'd be for blase for capitalism. Earlier you said that the uh, 8% tax rate to make things more equal is an act of violence. Yes. And um, now, obviously, objectivists have a different definition of what a state is than respondents do. And so objectivists uh, will always advocate for the existence of the state. Yes. And you said that people who advocate for more equality don't have a definition of what is a fair tax rate. Yeah. So what would be the objectivist definition of what a fair tax rate would be? Well, the definition of a fair tax for an objectivist would be a voluntary tax, would be a non-coercive tax. So one is, is uh, government revenues raised through uh, fee for services on some services, and the other would be where people wrote checks voluntarily, and they were, where there would be social aust 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 austerity. No, it's not austerity. Aust Ostracize, uh, ostracism, social ostracism against those who maybe didn't pay their, their taxes. But a, 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 an objectivist state would be so, government, would be so small, right? So you could, in the 19th century, the federal government in the United States uh, spent uh, about 3% of GDP. Uh, I mean, uh, that's what government, federal government spending was. And total government spending across all government uh, was, I think, uh, less than 5%. You know how much the federal government spends today? About 20. And uh, total spending across everything is somewhere in the mid-30s. Right? Right? So imagine if we shrunk back to the size of government in the 19th century. <coughs> you would shrink government about 80 to 90%. Right? So it would be nothing to pay tax, to, to, to raise revenues for a government that small. If I had to pay uh, only 10 to 20 percent of what I pay today, now I live in California, so I pay a lot more than that. So, um, I mean, my marginal income tax rate is 55 percent, a little less because I get to deduct my state taxes, but basically 55 percent, right? And that doesn't include state taxes. Uh, I mean, consumption taxes and everything else, sales taxes, right? You pay more than Canadians. Yeah, I'm paying because I live in, ca in California, and because I made good money last year, I'm paying more than Canadians. I, I, pay, I pay as much as Scandinavians do, right? I mean, it's ridiculous. This is the United States of America, the so-called land of the free, home of the brave, um, home of the wimps. Um, so if I only had to pay 5%, happily, for the police and the military and, and a judicial system that runs well, I would even pay 10% because I'm getting something in return. It's real, right? So I'm happy to pay. I'd probably overpay. Yeah, some other people would underpay, and some people would free ride. Who cares? But imagine if taxes are flat 10%. And this is the other thing Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand said. He said. She said, look, we've got such a long way to go until we get there. Who cares? Right? Let's, let's, let's agree that we have to shrink government spending, and we have to shrink taxes. When we get to the point where the government's only doing what it actually is supposed to do, we can figure out how to pay for it. It'll be easy because it'll be so small, and we'll believe in it, right? Because why do I resent paying taxes so much today? Because A, it's coerced, and B, I don't see the money. I drive on shitty roads, I, you know, so it's not like they're investing in infrastructure. Um, you know, what am I getting for it? My military is massive, and they don't know how to use it. Uh, the police force is corrupt. The judicial system is becoming more and more corrupt every day. And, and what, what, what am I getting for my money? Nothing. Negative value. So certainly 55%, I should see something for it. That's a lot of money. Right? So if I actually got value, it, it, I wouldn't care. Right? And, and the only thing I could get value from the government is in those areas where the government is, is uniquely 
is the only entity qualified to do something, which is in the area of force. So I'm not an anarchist for those. Uh, Well, I mean, there's no shortcuts, right? I mean, it's, it's about advocating for the ideas. I, I don't think you can just advocate for economics. I don't think you can just advocate for politics. You have to change the culture. You have to change people's orientation. And this is part of my whole BS view, my view that it's all BS about culture. Cultures suck, all of them do. I want to change them all. And ultimately, what I want is an objectivist culture, not a Korean culture, not an American culture. Not a, I want an individualistic culture. And if it's global, cool. And I don't care what race you are. I don't care what anything you are. If you hold an individual perspective on life, I'm your buddy. right? And, and I want you, you know, that's what I want. So I, 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 there's no alternative. And, and I think morality is the most important thing. So the, ultimately, it's all about ethics. You know, so, so if you want to really change the world, you have to convince people to be egoists and not to be altruists. You have to convince people to be individualists and not collectivists. And they will always be collectivists as long as they're altruists. So to, to destroy collectivism, you have to advocate for egoism. And unless we can convince the world to be rational egoists, the world will always be statist. And, and that's the history of, of the world. The only errors where people approached an understanding of egoism, those are the only areas where people were free. Greece and the Enlightenment. That's it. Those were the areas in which people were, you know, chose an individualistic morality. And those are the areas where, where you know, humanity has flourished. And, uh, and the, the manifestation of the Enlightenment is the 19th century and early 20th century, where people were mostly individualistic in their lives. But we've lost that, and we're becoming more and more collectivist. Although there's still remnants of it. So one of the beautiful things that happens when, you, when I travel all over the world is you can ask any audience in pretty much any country in the world today, China, Russia, any place, you ask them, who does your life belong to? And almost all of them say to me, that's amazing. Like 300 years ago, you ask people, who does your life belong to? And they'll say, oh, the church, the king, the tribe the community, whatever, right? But now they all know their life belongs to them. Now they don't understand the full implication of that and what responsibility that places on them and what that has to do with morality. But the world is more individualistic today as a global phenomenon than ever in history, and that's because Western civilization, Western culture has invaded the entire world, and everybody in the world is ultimately receptive to it it's just a matter of education, education, education. And we, it's our job, I think, to, to do that education. So, okay, your life belongs to you. What does that mean? What does that imply? What does that imply for morality? What does that imply for politics? What is that? But that's the starting point, right? Ethics. It's about, it's about living your life to the fullest, about making your life the best life they can be. And who, who could be against that, right? You tell people, you should make them. You should live life to the best of your ability, you should flourish, you should be happy, you should, everybody goes, yeah, I want to do that. You know? Do you think we should now take that message to North Korea? Absolutely, we should take it to North Korea. I know people who actually do. They, you know, the balloons, they, they put, uh, they put uh, you know, Ayn Rand stuff and Hayek and Mises and stuff, and they, they, they put it up in balloons and send it over to North Korea. So all kinds of ways in which this stuff is being smuggled into North Korea all the time. I think that the, 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 the Human Rights Foundation does some excellent work in North Korea. And, and uh, they, they take flash drives into Cuba with all of, uh, all of Ayn Rand's writings and other pro-liberty writings, and they get them into Cuba. So they do, a lot of people are doing that kind of work of getting good ideas into these places. But, I mean, we live in an amazing place where there are only like three or four countries in the entire world that are like North Korea. It used to be that half the world was like that, just not that long ago, right before the Berlin Wall came down. The whole world, half the world was like North Korea. So we've come a long way. But now we live, we all live in these mixed economies, which are kind of gray, dying, getting older. And that's what we have to fight now. It's not that we're fighting communism like in North Korea. We're fighting just the grayness of people not committing to anything. It's not even that they're really altruists. It's not that they're anything really. They, they're a mixture. They're a mixed economy 
of the spirit, the mixed economy of everything. Mixed, mixed philosophy, mixed morality, mixed politics, mixed economics. And that's an improvement of everything being black, but it's, it's you know, we've got a way to go. But, so if you really want one issue to really nail, it's the ethics. Because look, even, even with regard to the inequality thing, right? Altruism inculcates envy. Because if you know, I'm an, I'm an altruist, right? I, and al altruism means living for the sake of other people. That is, the purpose of your life is other people's well-being. You, your moral responsibility in life is to serve other people. That's what altruism means, as defined by Augustine Comte, who came up with the term, right? He invented the term. He was a French philosopher. So if you're an altruist and you're poor, it's like, God damn it, you're supposed to live for me and you have money. Why aren't you living for me? How come I don't have your money? So I resent you. I hate you. And if I'm rich and an altruist, I'm going, I should be helping these people. I don't really want to, but I should be helping these people. So I feel guilty. So I vote to have the government tax me more so that I get to help the people to reduce my guilt. So altruism is what creates all the mess that we're in. And that's what needs to be fought. And I don't think it's that hard to fight it. We just need to get out there because most people don't want to be altruistic. But they don't know any other way to think because that's all they've been taught. And actually, Asian countries, in this sense, I think Asia is, is, um, is far better than the West because Asia doesn't have, it doesn't have Christianity. And there's nothing, there's no worst form of altruism than the Christian form of altruism. Don't you say that it's Russia yeah. to protect her? I know, I know. <laughs> Most of Asia. Korea, you've got a problem. In Korea, you've got a problem. I mean, think about, think about what it means to grow up, to live your entire life with Jesus staring down from you from a cross, having suffered the worst kind of death possible to mankind, nailed to a cross. It's a slow painful, horrific, torturous death. For sins he did not commit. For sins you committed. Talk about sacrifice. Right? So, and this is the image of morality. The image of morality, the essence of morality is suffering and pain and, 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 and for, uh, for the sake of other people. I always, you know, I, I don't know. Have you ever seen, I mean, I always ask, have you ever seen a picture of a saint, of a Christian saint, with a smile on his face. <laughs> no. Heroes. Because the whole, yeah, because the whole point of sainthood is suffering. You can't be a saint if you had fun in life. Mother Teresa would have never been sainted if she actually enjoyed the work she did. She hated the work she did. That's why she was a saint. It's the fact, if you read her diaries, you, you know how much she hated what she did. She hated the people, she hated the work, she doubted God. She was a suffering, pathetic, miserable human being. That's why she's good. The more, suffering, the, the more suffering, the better. That's the essence of Christianity. I mean, the essence of it. Not the way people live it, but the essence of it. But the essence of it is always there in the image of Christ on a nail to a cross. And that's why every church, has, it's everywhere, right? It's in every home. It's people wear it around their necks. It's everywhere, that image. To remind you how pathetic you are. The fact that in most of Asia, you don't have to deal with that as your moral symbol is a massive advantage that Asia has over, over Europe, and particularly the United States. Now, Europe has become secularized, but it's kept the cross. Right? It's dropped God, but kept Jesus. America still holds, you know, has kept God. Right? But it's, it's a problem. The biggest problem we face in, in changing the world, in America at least, is religion. I think it's a bigger problem than, than the left. In a group? Sorry. Either one. I was say, in a group uh, like us, it's kind of easy to talk on maybe higher level, and we understand a lot of the concepts yep. that you're talking about. What about if you're uh, talking to somebody who is uh, very brand new to these ideas, and you want to get across, for example, the, the, the issue of altruism and why that is not the right yeah. way to go. Do you have like a go-to move for this is, you know, you got a short time. <laughs> no, because I, I think you have, to, you have to acknowledge the context and you have to, you know, what is the context in which this is coming up. 
there's no, there's no speech that you can, you know. Right. I mean, I wish, right? In, in, Atlas Shrugged is so amazing, right? Because Galt can walk into an executive's office, give him a two-hour speech, and the guy completely convinced and walks out with him, right? If I could do that, we'd change the world, given how many models I do and how many people I meet. You know, that's it. We'd be done, right? Now, I'm no John Galt, one. And two, even John Galt couldn't do it because it, it takes more than a speech. So you, you have to find the right context for the person. You have to find the right way of approaching them. But if you want my go-to lines, I mean, watch my videos, because particularly the Q&As, because those are the kind of questions I get constantly, right? And most of the audiences I talk to are not familiar with Ayn Rand. They're not familiar with the ideas. So I just did a tour of uh, British schools, high, sco uh, high schools, the top British schools in England, right? The, the, the e I don't know if you're familiar with Eton and uh, Harrow and all these like Harry Potter foo foo, like foo foo schools. They all look. You go to the school and it looks like Harry Potter. I mean, it's old buildings and these mess halls and uh, and they're boarding schools and and most of them are all, they're either all boy or all girl boarding schools and quite really interesting. But these are the smartest kids in England, right? And but they've never heard of Ayn Rand and and uh, so if you watch some of the videos from those you'll get a sense of how I approach it in terms of, but it depends on what the question is and what the context that it's coming up in. There's no, I wish there was. Well, I kind of wish there was. I wish there was just a, 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 a three arguments, and that would do, that's it, right? But on the other hand, I don't wish there was, because if there was, it would mean that people don't have free will and it's, you know, very deterministic. So, you know, we have the reality we have, and you just got to deal with it. Well, that he's wrong. I mean, Ben Shapiro's, ben Shapiro's the smartest of them, of, of the whole bunch. And, he, and he's, he's Jewish, he's not Christian. He was a yarmulke. But what'd you do with Christian values exactly, right? The one that says that if God tells you to kill your own son, you should do it, right? Abraham, I, I don't know how much you know the Bible. But, like, God tells Abraham, go kill your son. And Abraham says, okay, off I go, right? No questioning. No rebellion. And this is, why he's a, this is why he's a hero, right? Why is he a hero? Because he didn't doubt. He just, God told him to kill his sons. He went, what kind of God is that? What values does that teach you? You know what value it teaches you? Obedience. Now, obedience doesn't lead to freedom. Obedience doesn't lead to the, the, the American Revolution. Obedience doesn't lead to the, the, the Enlightenment, right? Okay, t t take, take another one. Moses comes down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments. Right? And a bunch of Jews are worshiping a golden calf. Right? They disobeyed orders. So he doesn't calmly lay the tablets down and go over to them and say, look, I believe in religious freedom. Go do your thing. You go over there and we'll do our thing. No. He drops the Ten Commandments because he's so frigging furious, right? And they shatter. And he picks up a sword with his brother Aaron and they slaughter 30,000 people in one day. And God rewards them because this was a good thing. Okay, where's religious freedom, tolerance of different points of view? There's none of that in the Old Testament. Now, granted, the New Testament is softer. So the Christian, because it's, because it's a religion of, 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 uh, of weakness, right? Uh, you know, Judaism is a, a, a religion of transition, and Islam is a religion of strength. Christianity is a religion of weakness, right? So yeah, turn the other cheek, yes, if any Christian does that, right? Love thy neighbor like yourself. You know, that's, that's, that's because Christianity is, is a minority religion in a Roman Empire that is crushing them and destroying them, so they have to get along, right? But it, it's not for any theological reason. It's, it's a political reality. So they create a religion that's politically feasible for them to, to exist under, right? It develops under that. And when they get power, guess what the Christians do? Once they get political power, they have Augustine, rewrite the story of turn the other cheek so now they can slaughter people and they go off and they start conquering the world. You know, there's no difference. So there's no Judeo-Christian values that are consistent with freedom. Now, yes, I don't know. You got, you got a personal relationship with God, some of them say, and, and, uh, and uh, what else? Uh, you know, thou shalt not murder. 
Every single religion in all of human history has a commandment that shall not murder. Nothing unique about the Judeo-Christian tradition. I'm sure in Korea's tradition, there's somewhere law that says that's against murdering. So it's, where does it come from? Where, you know, yes, it happened, the Western civilization developed in Europe. You know why? Because Greece is in Europe. They lucked out. So Western civilization is Greek. It's not Christian. It's Aristotle. It's Plato. It's not, it's, it's, it's what do they call it? I forget the name of the sculptors. Per Pericles was the politician. Anyway, yeah, it's those guys. They created Western civilization, and they were pagans. And, and when did Western civilization wake up? At the Renaissance. The Renaissance of what? What was it a Renaissance of? Of Greece. And what's the Enlightenment? The Enlightenment is the application of Greek ideas to science and to po politics and to everything, right? So there's no, forget about, you know, there's, I mean, I'm not saying there's no value in the Judeo-Christian tradition. There's some value. Religion is a primitive form of philosophy, and people need it, and it's, there is a value to it. But to attribute the success of the West to that is absurd. And if you, if you, if you read the Founding Fathers in the Federalist Society, how, in the Federalist Papers, you know, the debating political issues and the debating these things, how often do they cite the Old Testament or the New Testament? Almost never. Who do they cite constantly? Montesquieu. Montesquieu, a French philosopher, right? I think he was an atheist. They cite Locke. You know, they cite philosophers, not religious leaders. They don't cite the Pope, right? So it's, it's it, mind-boggling to me. Uh, but, it, but it's only, you know, America's obsessed with religion which is my biggest disappointment with America when I came there. I came in 1987, and um, I couldn't believe how obsessed everybody was with religion. Even the objectivists, the, the, the atheist objectivists, constantly were talking about religion. To me, like, I became an atheist, I think, at the age six or seven, and, like, that was it. Religion was over, and, you know, and, and it wasn't like I didn't go to synagogue, and I didn't, we didn't have our Friday night prayers. I did all that, but it was like religion was gone. I, I, I went through the motions, I had a bar mitzvah, I did all the motion things, but I never, never thought about it twice. And yet Americans constantly think about religion, and they can't, div it's like, but it, but it really is, they believe, like Jordan Peterson does, that you cannot have morality without religion. And I think they latch onto the religion, because they want to be good people. So that's my more benevolent view. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if maybe that's why um, there's, there's almost no talk or no, uh, even acknowledgement of uh, the, the, uh, the manner in which Rand um, uh, dealt with the is ought uh, issue. And if you deny that, if you deny how she arrived at that and how she yeah. built past that, then again, you now have your monopoly on where did morality come from. But if you acknowledge that, then you lose your monopoly. Yes. Yeah, but yes. So, so, so a big part of that is that, but it's also that secular people don't want to don't want to accept the Izzat, her particular derivation of the Izzat, partially because of the way she does philosophy, which is very different than the way conventional philosophy is done, and they just they just don't want to acknowledge it, and and uh, they they can't get their head around it. They can't. So I know philosophers who, who just don't get it. They just re reject it, not because they're religious, but because they just it just doesn't compute to them. Um, which is very frustrating because I, I think her solution to the is ought problem is a very you know the is ought problem is how do you get a ought from an is, how do you get a you should from it is, right? And and she solves it elegantly I think, but but people don't recognize it, yeah, which is yeah. Could you go in greater detail on that? How Ayn Rand is different from conventional philosophers? Uh, is, is, I'm, I'm thinking you're talking about method or something. Yeah, I mean, I mean, um, I, I, you know, this is beyond my pay grade. Um, well, because I've, I'm not a philosopher, and, and I've never really taken a philosophy class, so, so I, I'm not an expert on other philosophers. I'm, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm an expert on Ayn Rand, but I'm certainly not a, an expert. But if you read, I mean, partially if you, if you pick up a book by Kant, right, you can't even read the thing, right? It's unintelligible without massive amounts of effort. When you read Ayn Rand, it's intelligible. It flows. I mean, that's partially th the fact that she speaks and her logic is reality-based. So it's not, 
academic in the sense of detached from reality. Um, I find it very hard to read philosophy because it's it mostly is detached from reality. What I love about Rand is how attached it is to the real world, how, t how, 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 how much it makes sense, common sense people say, right? But it's common sense because of that connection to reality. But take the is odd dichotomy. So, so forever in his, so suppose the Hume, the philosopher Hume said, you can't derive an art from an is. So the world is, we can absorb that, but that says nothing about what I should do. Right? And most philosophers have said, yeah, absolutely, you can't do that. Now, I think the Greeks would have found that weird because they would have said, well, how do we get shoulds if not from is's? Yeah. Right? I think because the, the Greeks were very attached to reality. Um, some reality, even Plato would have said, okay, maybe you can't derive it from this reality, but there's another reality in where the should is real. So you know what it is, right? The world of forms, where, where goodness and justice actually live and reside, so you can, you can see them directly. But the idea that, that, that what art is, you know, is, is subjective, is whatever you feel like, would have been weird for the, for the Greeks. Um, and, and, and Christianity is just Platonism, right? So it's instead of a world of forms, it's God. But the art comes from somewhere else, from revelation. And Rand is the first one to say, well, first one to really articulate a case that it uh, is. Now, Sam Harris does something similar. He, he tries to derive an art from it is, and, and is generally in the right direction. He just, he doesn't have the sophistication Ayn Rand does. Uh, so it's not that hard to see it. You look at the objectivist ethics? Yeah. Yeah, that's where she does it, right? I was looking for the page where that was mentioned. Yeah, it's, it's mentioned, it's fairly early on where she, do, she does it, she basically, I mean, you have to understand what art, what art is, what art is. yes, I was going to say that and then stop myself, but yes, what art is, that is, what does it refer to? If art refers to human life, then, then what you ought to do is a direct consequence of what human life is and what human life requires. So it becomes a scientific question, what the arts are, just science what leads to human flourishing. And how you get that human life is the art is a whole discussion in the objectivist ethics about what value is and that only human life gives value any meaning and therefore, and you, you know, you, fa you face this fundamental choice between existence and non-existence, life or death. Once you choose life, then the arts are obvious consequences of isus because what does human life require? Yeah, because reason and, and, and all these things, right? And, and so, but that's is. That's an is that now becomes an art. So once you buy into her life or death, what a value is, and that only the individual's life makes value meaningful, it, once you buy into that, then the is or gap is simple. What is the object of it? The object of is it to give you guidance on how to live, how to live a good life. So what is the object of any philosophy? The, the object of any philosophy is, to, is, is truth, is, is to discover the truth about life and about reality. But Ayn Rand talked about her philosophy, the purpose of her philosophy is to uh, provide us guidance on how to live life on this earth to the best of our ability. Okay, so it's different in this sense. Subjective says that there is no firm reality and that whatever you want is the good. Rand rejects that and she says, no, there is a firm reality and your nature is firm. That is, human beings have a particular nature. And therefore, what is good for you is not whatever you want. 
What is good for you must be discovered scientifically, objectively, rationally. And it's objective. So there are, there are certain things that are good for all human beings. Rousseau. Yeah, Rousseau. I mean, uh, um, his uh, concept is uh, phenomena. Oh, uh, uh, Rousseau. Yeah, yeah Rousseau. Okay. The German philosopher. German philosopher. Yeah. German philosopher. Yeah. German philosopher but, but he's Jewish, and, yeah. but he's uh, one of the most uh, uh, respectful Jewish. Uh, uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. And, uh, his concept is uh, phenomena is a sort of a, what appears, what it appears. Yeah. It is, it is a, uh, it, 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 it just includes both of them, object, uh, objectivism and subjectivism, yeah. both of them. So, so Rand rejects that. So that's, that's a very Kantian approach. Uh -huh. um, Rand says, no, reality is what it is. This table is here. It has certain characteristics that are independent of, of us. It, it is. It is, A is A. Reality is what it is. And then we, as individuals, have the tools to identify it, to see it, to, 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 to identify the material it's made of, to describe it, and that's human reason. And it's objective. If we identify what's really in reality, that's what being objective means. It means identifying the reality, identifying what's real, not identifying what we feel like, and, it, and, and it's, it requires human consciousness to be objective because we, we have to see it. We have to integrate the knowledge. But it's, it's of something real with a certain identity in the world out there. It's not a phenomena. It's a real thing. If uh, Ayn Rand's uh, philosophy is based on uh, physics, what, uh, what kind of physics is it going to be? It's not based on physics. It's not based on science. Philosophy can't be based on science. Science is based on philosophy. I mean, approach to science. My thinking on that it is related with the Cartesian philosophy. No, I don't, not at all. I don't think so. Cartesian, I mean, Cartesian philosophy actually, actually is, uh, you know, I, I, I am, what is it? Uh, I think, therefore I am, right? That's Descartes. And she's against that, right? She's against that. She says, I am, therefore I think. Another one is that, uh, you know. But I don't think she's, she's not a determinist. She's not, it's not about physics. It's, not, it's about human consciousness. Is, is, you saw two things in reality out there. There's the world external of consciousness, and there's consciousness. And the essence of consciousness is to observe, the function of consciousness is to observe reality. Just to observe the, the, the world out there. I mean, uh, physics uh, improved uh, what is developed uh, um, from the Cartesian stuff. Uh, <coughs> the energy and the uh, particle is uh, almost the same thing uh, uh, in, in point of view. Yes. I mean, uh, but I don't it, is, it is later er era, which... Uh, it's later era, yeah, so, yes. I mean, at the time, uh, maybe... Um, Ayn Rand is not affected that theory in the in the world in the yeah. in the era. Yeah, that's my point. Yeah. I don't I, I think it's dangerous to think about philosophy in physics terms. They're two different things. You had a question and Well if you if you think you're Well Jeremy's the boss, not me. <laughs> well we're you're so pumped up on morality and uh, metaphysics, but the effect of Voluntary uh, financing of government. Um, if you if you might just give a quick one on why there could not be a market in retaliatory use of force, and then maybe you can like get us a follow up if you not if you don't like. Ah, you know. uh, see, you want you want me to do a you you want me to cover an alco capitalism in spite of everything? No, I don't think it's a huge question. I, I think it's a very simple issue. I mean, two things. One, you can't have a, you can't have a market in force. Markets require, the, the very nature of market requires there not to be force. That's, that's what makes a market a market. Force is out and therefore we have to negotiate. Everything is voluntary based on trade. You can't therefore have a market in force. 
The one thing that has to be extracted in order for a market to exist, you can't internalize it into the marketplace. It creates violence. So all you get, what is the, what is the standard by which we determine? It's who has the biggest guns. And so, so anarchy always devolves into authoritarianism or just pure violence, right? There's a reason why in, in our terminology, anarchy means everybody's shooting at everybody else. Because that's what it is. That's what it literally is. Uh, it doesn't work. You, and you can't, you, you can create mind games about it, but it doesn't actually, but there's a deeper issue. And the deeper issue is an epistemological issue. The anarcho-capitalists don't believe in objective reality. They don't believe in objective law. They don't believe in objective truth. So law, for example, is not something that is objective and set and done. It's you have your laws, I have my laws, I have my police force backing my laws, you have your police force backing your laws, and now we negotiate, right? That's, you know, so it's a rejection of the a absoluteness of, of a legal system. And Ayn Rand says, no, you need, you need a, 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 an objective law. You need a court system that arbitrates disputes based on that objective law. And it's not who pays whom more, whatever the legal system they want. Now, you could have different legal systems in different geographic areas, and in that sense, they can compete. But in a particular geographic area, you need some objective standard by which what constitutes force and what doesn't constitute force is defined. What's your view on the Second Amendment? I mean, Second Amendment is a complex issue, partially because the intention of the Second Amendment is clearly to allow the population to be armed so that it can rebel against government. But in a world in which governments have big, big, big weapons, including nukes, it's meaningless to, to say, I have a right to have a, a little handgun because I'm going to rebel against the government. I mean, it's just, it just doesn't make any sense, right? You're not going to rebel against the government. It's not the intention of most people who have guns to rebel. And if you did, you'd be slaughtered and you'd be crushed. So now, I think you have a right to bear arms in a sense of self-defense. So in the emergency where the police can't get to you in time, you should be able to defend yourself and you should be allowed to have the weapons necessary for that emergency in order to protect yourself. Okay, but then what are those guns? And, and how big can they be? And all of that is, is, I think, an interesting legal question. And I don't think objectivism has a clear answer uh, on that. I mean, I have my opinions. I know a lot of objectivists who disagree with me on it because I, don't, I, I think it's something for legal scholars to, to really think about and, and analyze and come up with an answer. Where's the line? You, I don't think you can have a tank. It's okay to have a handgun, AK-47, automatic, semi-automatic, does it make a difference, who cares? Should you have it at all? Should you register with the government? I think you should. I think the government should have a registry of all the arms out there because I think it's part of its monopoly over the, use of for, of, over the retaliatory use of force to keep track of weapons of force. The only reason guns exist is to kill people. Yeah, but to kill people, right? To kill people for protection, right? But it's to kill people. So it's about violence. The essence of guns is violence. And therefore, since the government is responsible for all things violent, it should monitor what's being, you know, how, 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 who owns the guns. Now, if you accept the Second Amendment as, as allowing you to hold guns in order to rebel against the government, well, of course you don't want the government to register the guns because <laughs> the whole purpose of accumulating the guns is to fight them. But I don't believe that anymore. I don't believe it's viable in a modern society to rebel against the government using guns. So, um... It's a bit like car insurance, though. You kind of, you have car insurance, but the hope you never have to use it. No. I can't use it. What does it mean to rebel against the American government? It means to die. It's, it's not like the Founding Fathers. It's not like a hundred years ago. You know, there's no, you know, there's no, um, there's no victory here. Right? What, what are you, you going to go up your AK-47? Have you ever seen a tank? Do you know what a tank will do to you? I mean, never mind a nuke. I mean, they have big, big, big weapons that the Founding Fathers couldn't imagine. Yeah, I just, I'm from Ireland, and even like a small force in Ireland, like it was able to overthrow the British government. Yeah, only because the British government wouldn't wipe you out, but, but they could have defeated you at any moment, right? I, believe me, as, as a former Israeli, uh, military intelligence guy, they could have crushed you. Now, a lot of, they didn't want to. They decided not to crush you, but they could have crushed you. They would have had to kill a lot of you, 
not just a few, a lot, right? But they, you know, they could have taken, uh, they could have taken Belfast and flattened it, and the IRA would have disappeared. But so, yes, in that sense, you can rebel, but that's not a revolution, right? A, a revolution is armed revolt against your government, and. You know, okay, you know, if you, 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 you think you can do it, I'm, I'm open to that argument. That's why I think it's a complex issue, and, and I, I don't think it's that important because there's not going to be a revolution in America, so who cares about the Second Amendment? It, it, it works in America, though, because it's never fallen under a dictatorship. It's obviously... Not because we have guns. It has nothing to do with it. Zero to do with it. Zero. And America will fall under dictatorship in spite of all the arms, because the fact is, a lot of the people who've got a lot of guns are the ones who want dictatorship. You think because you own guns, you don't want a dictatorship? Quite the contrary. They want to just go out and slaughter the leftists so they can establish their own dictatorship. I mean, there's no, there's no correspondence between people arming themselves and, and truly understanding and loving freedom. You know. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't... I don't, um, I mean, I have a gun because I, I want to defend myself. Not, not, you know, it's locked in a safe and I can't remember the combination and I, you know, and I'm never, and I've got, I've even got a concealed weapons permit. So I could, I could walk around the streets in California with my gun on my belt, but I, I never have because I, I find the whole idea so frigging ridiculous and, and oppressive that I, I don't want to do it. But, but I have the option and I want that option. Because people, there are people out there who want to kill me, but you look like you know. Like me? No. Yeah, I was gonna say, whoa! <laughs> I didn't bring my weapon to Korea. <laughs> no, no, there are people out there who want to kill me. I mean, uh, wh whether they're complete nutcases. There's a guy who came knocking at the door. That I'll end with this guy who came knocking at the door of the Andrew Institute and said, you know, I really want to see Ron Brook. And they said, why? He said, because the government's implanted a chip in his brain, and I'm here to take it out. Wow. Yeah. Um, and he had a gun in his backpack, it turned out. So, you know, he, he obviously was mentally, you know, he landed up in a mental institution. It was problematic. But A, there are people like that. B, there are, there are a bunch of Muslims who don't like me. And, um, and, you know, and so there are a lot of people who I offend. And um, so I want to be able to protect myself. But I am under no illusion that I am going to go and fight, uh, fight the American Special Forces. Again, as somebody who's been in the military, I know what they can do. But it's, if you look at history, it's never good that uh, weapons are monopolized with the state. It doesn't matter. You know, people make up these stories about that all the guns were confiscated from the Jews in Germany, and that's why they were saying, bullshit. It's a made-up story. I think it happened in Cambodia and Russia. It didn't happen anywhere. It's never been the case that, that authoritarianisms have driven to power because the civilians didn't have their handguns, and particularly Jews. I mean, the Jews of Europe were not gonna were not gonna <coughs> fight, and when they did decide to fight, like in in Warsaw, they found guns in order to fight. The fact that the Germans had taken their guns didn't stop them from rebelling, in 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 the in the rebellion of the of the Warsaw Ghetto. But the idea that the Germans, if the German Jews had just had their weapons. The, the Nazis would have spared them somehow, is absurd. Maybe it would have cost the Nazis a little bit more to kill them all, but it's doubtful that the German Jews would have ever used their weapons. I mean, they went to the concentration camps. They just walked in like sheep, like sheep. I mean, I, believe me, these are my people. I've studied their history. They, they, they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it was happening to them, and they just walked in. Nobody said, oh, if I'd had my gun, I would be, you know, I'd be fighting. No. They, I mean, it took them years and years before they woke up to what the reality was. They realized how evil it was, and then they found guns and they rebelled. In a few isolated cases. Most of them never did. But you say you all agree that the right to bear arms would, it, would it still be a big thing? Of course it would be. I mean, you think people want to be free. I don't. I don't think people want to be free. If people wanted to be free, why is it that 99.9% .9 of human history we've been enslaved in one way or the other? Which goes back to the ideas of having the ideas. It's about ideas. So there's no, I, this is my disagreement with George W. Bush when he said all people yearn, you know, for freedom when he invaded Iraq or whatever. But it's nonsense. Most people don't yearn for freedom. Most people want to be told what to do. 
And they have to gain the right ideas in order to realize that that's wrong and that they could live a much better life if only they could live it for themselves. But that's an achievement. Freedom is a massive achievement. It's an achievement at the individual level, and it's certainly an achievement at the cultural level. And this way, I mean, how long has South Korea been free? Not for very long, right? So and most of the world is, is very, very young to freedom because it's such a massive, massive achievement, an achievement that was made intellectually in Europe based on Greek ideas. I suppose freedom is just, it only depends on your ability to defend it. Yes, but not with weapons. It depends on your ability to defend it intellectually. Intellectually. The Russians couldn't defend their freedom intellectually. The communists were the smallest of minorities with no weapons, and they took over a massive government and crushed them because there was no intellectual opposition to them. The Khmer Rouge in Cambodia were a tiny little minority with no weapons, and they took over the country through ideas not a, without a shot fired. And most of these revolutions happened with no shots fired. It's not about weapons. It's not about uh, uh, guns. Hitler didn't come to power by having an armed revolution. He got people to vote for him. And then the army initially was opposed to him, and then he convinced them to be for him. So they all, they all joined the Nazi party. Not because Hitler was powerful. The Nazi party was a tiny little minority. Nobody cared about the Nazis. They could have wiped them out within days. Revolutions don't happen because people with big guns show up and take over a country. People with little guns and big ideas. It's all, all, all about ideas. It's not about guns. That's why I don't think it matters one way or the other whether the American people are armed or not. If they have bad ideas, we'll get a dictatorship. If they have good ideas, we'll remain free. And guns don't matter one way or the other. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. A pleasure. Yeah, it was really a very, very lively conversation and, and a pleasure to have you. Pleasure and, to be here. Um, and uh, again, another thanks for YP Lee for allowing us to use his audience. Yeah. And for all of you guys for coming out, I really appreciate it.